Hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about the history of negative numbers. Um, I wanted to do this topic because I hope soon to be teaching math at a middle school level and to be honest I didn't feel very equipped with the knowledge of middle school concepts um, as much as I do in, in elementary school. So I wanted to explore a topic that I was unfamiliar with, especially the historical aspect of that topic. Um, so during my presentation, we will be touching upon let's see, um, a brief historical overview of the use of negative numbers, the acceptance of negative numbers within different time periods in societies, especially the Eastern mathematics. Um, what you'll find is that Eastern societies such as China and India more readily extended their concept of number into the negative um, domain and Western mathematics was more weary so we're going to take a look at those Eastern societies in, in more depth. Um, I have a couple activities planned. The one for in class has to do with Chinese counting rods um, and the one for out of class is a short video and an accompanying lesson plan to view and to read and then to kind of write a reflection about. Um, so again, it's mostly about those Eastern societies because they were the first to have their hand in the concept of negative numbers. Some of the main points that I want you to take away are that negative numbers were not widely accepted throughout history. Um, actually, it was very culturally diverse, the acceptance and rejection of these numbers. Um, China and India, like I mentioned, were the first to expand their understanding into this abstract notion. Um, another thing that I realized in my research is that a lot of the literature that I came across and all of the abstracts mentioned how challenging the concept of negative numbers is for students. So I think that by infusing this historical dimension, you know, to state that even the, high, the most highly regarded mathematicians throughout history had trouble conceptualizing negative numbers, that could definitely make the concept more approachable to them. Not only that, that historical perspective can, you know, motivate, can hold their interest, but also some of the, um, the ways that ancient societies conceptualize negative numbers are through manipulatives. So I thought that that could really help our students to um, form a conceptual picture of negative numbers. So interestingly, negative numbers had a very troubled past. Um, this quote from the mid-1700s kind of depicts it. Negative numbers darken the very whole doctrines of the equations and mark dark of things which are in their nature excessively obvious and simple. So a lot of people rejected them because they kind of made the waters murky, um, to put it simply. Um, some of the obstacles that were faced in trying to accept negative numbers were that people had a difficult time differentiating between zero as an absolute, meaning it was absolutely the smallest number, you know, you, you couldn't go anywhere below that, and so they had trouble differentiating between that idea and zero as an origin, meaning zero as a place to start to go in either direction. Also, um, people had, a, had difficulty recognizing the difference between a quantity, something that could actually be counted, um, because in historical societies, as we have been learning, um, people were very practical in their use of mathematics. Um, and so trying to differentiate between the abstract number and the actual concrete number was challenging. Um, and another, another thing that kind of went into this was that Western societies including Greece were so predominantly um, geometrical. So negative numbers in geometry, it just didn't add up for them. So it, it would be, if you think about it like this, you can have a negative area, you can have a negative length. So because negative numbers didn't make geometrical sense, their acceptance in Greece and other Western nations was, was not one of the first things to be discussed. So that's kind of, you know, their troubled past. They weren't widely accepted for a while and we'll get more into their recent history later. Um, so let's transition to talk about China's hand in negative numbers. Their concept was practical. It had to do with, you know, economic transactions, and so they viewed the concept of a negative number to be amount that has yet to be paid or a quantity that was subtracted from another quantity. They used red rods to show positives and black rods to show negatives, and Lu Hui mentioned in his commentary on one of the first mathematic books where we see negative numbers, he commented that in order to um, reckon with these rods, you would merge and mutually eliminate opposing um, colors. So a red and a black would mutually eliminate together, and with that same notion you could mutually add um, when computing with them. So here is kind of what it looks like. They did have a, the Chinese during this time had a positional number system. So 
and, and it was um, base 10, so it was a decimal system. So the way that they showed large numbers using the digits 1 through 9 was by kind of interchanging representations. So if you see this first row right here, um, these were are all one way to show these digits, and these were used in particular places, the ones place, the hundreds place, the ten thousands place, interchangeably. In the bottom row are, you know, the exact same way of saying a six, so the six can be represented in two different ways, the five can be represented in two different ways. It's just dependent on the place value, what way you'll use. So if you look at this number over here to the side, um, you can see that, you know, it goes from horizontal to vertical, horizontal to vertical. So they use them interchangeably to show that the place value is changing. Um, and again, red is positive, so these represent positive quantities. When you're computing with Chinese rods, um, what a lot of people would do is use count computing boards that basically were just a grid to keep um, the positions aligned. Um, and Chinese, the Chinese had sign rules, though not as specific as Brahmagupta's, which we'll talk about soon. But these two statements right here kind of sum up all of the computation that you would perform on Chinese rods. So when adding, like signs add and opposite signs subtract. And when subtracting, like signs subtract and opposite signs add. So if you look over here at these examples, I think this can help to clarify. So it's clear that, you know, when you're adding, these, these have like signs. They're both positive, 4 and 5, so you would add. But when you're adding with opposite signs, you subtract. And that makes sense because, you know, now we know that adding a negative is the same thing as subtracting. So that kind of checks out. Similarly, down here, like signs, the 4 and the 5 are both positive. You'd subtract like normal. Um, however, below the final example has them with different signs. The 4 is positive, the 5 is negative, in which case you would add. Which makes sense to, you know, our, our current pedagogy that says that subtracting a negative is the same thing as adding. So, like I said, these aren't extremely clear because, as you know, commutatively, you know, with this addition and kind of the opposite, there's, there's more representations than just this. And so, Brahmagupta's sign rules are a little bit more specific. Instead of two statements, like the Chinese kind of relied upon, Brahmagupta ends up having 11 different statements. So, we'll talk about that soon. So what I wanted you guys to do was, you could pause the video, you can do this at the end, it's kind of up to you, but um, if you click here, there's an electronic version of the worksheet. The worksheet includes three parts that I made to align with the presentation. One of them is about interpreting Chinese numerals with the counting rods, representing them um, in different forms, and computing. So go ahead and you can pause the video and try that on your own. Um, it's a couple pages. so. I, and I do plan to go over it once you're done. Okay, hopefully if you're on this part, you've already done the, um, the, the worksheet. So I wanted to go over, part one is kind of, not. I don't think it's very challenging for you, so I wanted to go over the parts with more, um, more applications. So part two discusses creating quantities, and I thought this is a really cool opportunity to engage your students in math talk. So representing the quantity positive 4 with Chinese numerals could be done in many different ways. And you know some of the, quant the representations that you have on your worksheet could look much different from the ones that I've decided to include. Um, now I, I think that the key part is the explanation. Having students explain why 5 red rods and 1 black rod is still the quantity 4, 4 positives. Um, we want them to use words such as mutually eliminate. We want them to use words such as inverses in their explanation if they're going to be, you know, getting the most out of it. And so I hope that um, this is a cool opportunity for you to see that there's a lot of different ways to represent this. And I hope that the computing went well. I pulled out a couple examples, 6 plus negative 2, 5 minus 8, and 5 um, take away negative 2. So there's a couple ways to represent this, of course, and I just chose um, one way that I could show pretty easily on here. Um, six positives, so six red rods c being combined with two negatives. In this case, you would have to mutually eliminate. Because there's two negatives, you can also get rid of two positives, and you're left with four positives. And the second example, five take away eight. There's a couple ways to do this. Um, but since subtraction is the same thing as adding a negative, you can start with five red rods and eight black rods, 
and then mutually eliminate until you have no, no more left to eliminate, in which case you'd be left with three negatives. And the final one, um, it'd be interesting to just kind of see what students did with this, but you'd have to mutually add in order to be able to take away two negatives because initially you don't start out with any negatives to take away. So what you're left with after you add, mutually add two black rods and two red rods to balance, and you get rid of those two, two negative rods, you're left with total seven positives. Okay, so let's transition to talk about Brahmagupta for a bit. Um, India, another society that very, very readily accepted the um, notion of negative numbers, and in large part due to Brahmagupta, he saw use of numbers outside of counting and measuring. He saw more abstract use. Um, previously, three minus four would have been considered a meaningless thing. They would have either said, you know, it's not solvable, or it would be zero because it would be the closest they could get. Um, until Brahmagupta, they, the, this, this expression would have been um, not very solvable. Brahmagupta also had a huge influence algebra. He noted that quadratic equations theoretically could have more than one possible answer. So, for example, the square root of 9 could have been either 3 or negative 3, and so he realized that um, it could have two possible answers, one of which could be negative. Brahmagupta, like the um, Chinese, it was his original experimentation with negative numbers was economically driven, driven this practicality um, in everyday life. So he referred to positive quantities as property or fortune and negative quantities as debt or loss. And so using those words, he wrote 11 statements for sign rules or um, rules about how you would compute with given quantities. Um, he actually included sign rules with multiplication and division as well, which the Chinese did not. So um, we can see these 11 statements here, and they're pretty comprehensive. And, you know, just a, just a thought would be in practice to have students investigate these statements. You know, can you prove that they're true? Um, and it would be interesting for them to, to learn the language that was used in that time. Okay, so to expand upon your knowledge of Brahmagupta, I wanted you to watch this video here. Um, it was taken from a cool website, Twig Carolina, um, and it outlines India's hand in the concept of negative numbers. And then there's this lesson plan. Although it's brief, it accompanies this video, and I thought that you guys could watch and read it and then kind of reflect about what you found. As I mentioned, um, just kind of, to kind of wrap up, um, the recent history is when things started, started to finally fall together. Um, the history is long. You can see it's before, before Christ that um, people were having the, or starting to think about negative numbers as a concept. Um, but not until the 19th century were, were the use of negative numbers, the concept of negative numbers, was it widely accepted. So um, algebra, when, once algebra began to flourish, the use of negative numbers began to flourish. And I do want to note that, you know, given my grade level and, you know, the age at which I'd be wanting to delve into this topic, I wanted to focus more on the concept and the computing, but there is a vast array, and a lot of the literature I read, there's a vast array of information about how the history of negative numbers correlates with algebra. And so I just, I wanted to put that out there because that there's a lot of information there, but for my purposes, I wanted to focus more on the concept and computing. Um, so I hope that you guys took away a bit. I attached this presentation if you want to use it in your own practice without my voiceover too. So, um, and then here are the sources that I used in case you want to use them too. They're great sources, very trustworthy, scholarly, and um, there's more information that you can find there outside of my presentation. All right, thank you.